Thank you, everyone. I'm joined by the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Greg Hunt, and Professor Skerritt, who heads up the Therapeutic Goods Administration. I said several weeks ago at the press club that our top priority this year was to roll out the vaccination program here in Australia. This is an enormous exercise. There has been meticulous planning undertaken for an extensive period of time to make sure we get this right so that Australians can have absolute confidence in the program that has been rolled out here in Australia. The vaccination program is critical to our ongoing management of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the vaccines um, that we have, um, they address the critical issue of serious disease and indeed um, the risk of fatality that can arise from COVID-19. And increasingly we're seeing positive signs about its impact on transmissibility as well. Um, this is an enormous exercise which requires many steps. The planning of the strategy, the securing of the vaccines, going through the important approvals process, which can give Australians confidence. I said this morning, when we take our children to be vaccinated, it's Professor Skerritt who says that that vaccine is safe for your children to take. This is the same Professor Skerritt who's telling you when it comes to these vaccines that they're safe to take and it's in your interests and the public health interest of the nation. And so that's why I'm pleased to say today that the Therapeutic Goods Administration has today approved the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine for use in Australia following a full and thorough assessment process. Um, the vaccine has met requirements for uh, standards for safety, quality and efficacy and will be provided free to Australians. And it means that Australia now has two safe and effective COVID-9 vaccines available. Initial supply into Australia will be imported from overseas. And in the coming months, the AstraZeneca vaccine will be manufactured here in Australia, as the Minister for Health and Aged Care and I visited uh, the facility in Melbourne just last Friday. And that will mean Australia is one of few countries in the world that can manufacture its own COVID-19 vaccine here by CSL. Um, our vaccination program is on track. Our vaccination program has the backing of Australia's best medical experts, uh, and that means uh, that we can proceed uh, along the path that we have set out, and I look forward uh, to working with all the states and territories and medical health professionals across the country, um, those involved in the logistics supply chain, to ensure we can get this out right across the country, and it's going to make a huge difference to how we live here in Australia this year and in the years ahead. I'll pass you on to the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Professor Skerritt. AstraZeneca is cleared for liftoff. And uh, what I can say is that the TGA has approved uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine for use in Australia uh, on the basis of uh, all ages and uh, a second dose at 12 weeks. Um, they've taken the best advice from around the world. They've also had uh, the opportunity to examine uh, the advice and real world evidence uh, gathered uh, from the emergency use provisions in other countries. Uh, in particular, uh, the Lancet Journal uh, said uh, very recently in a, an article published on the 3rd of February 2021, COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca confirms 100% protection against severe disease, hospitalisation and death in the primary analysis of phase three trials. That's the Lancet. And then overnight, uh, the World Health Organisation in its uh, statement uh, for authorisation of use noted that the AstraZeneca vaccine was shown in clinical trials to be safe and effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 with no severe cases and no hospitalisations more than 14 days after the second dose. Now, the world will obviously continue to gather uh, evidence on safety and efficacy, but from uh, the Lancet Journal, from the clinical trials, from the Wo uh, World Health Organisation, the strongest possible advice. Uh, our Australian officials have taken advice from the United Kingdom. What that means uh, is that the uh, vaccine rollout is on track. Yesterday, we mentioned the Pfizer vaccine. I can confirm today that we are expecting at least 240 aged care facilities to be uh, included in the vaccine program next week. And that's uh, a very important step forward in protecting our older Australians. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, uh, on current uh, advice, uh, we hope and expect that it should be able to commence subject to shipping confirmation, which we can now proceed to 
in early March, if not earlier, in early March, if not earlier. Uh, and then, of course, we move to an increase in uh, total numbers with the CSL uh, Australian-made AstraZeneca vaccine due subject to TGA approval to commence uh, in late March at a million doses per week to be made available. So that program will help keep Australians safe. And then uh, finally, uh, I would note that uh, around Australia we have seen two new cases of community transmission, both within Victoria, both already on the advice I have within isolation, uh, seven states and territories with zero cases and a total of uh, 55,000 uh, tests around the country. Um, at a time when we know that there were 374,000 cases and 8,200 lives lost, sadly, around the world. So our containment is strong, but we always have to remain vigilant. The vaccine rollout is on track, and today's another important milestone. I particularly, John, before asking you to, um, to speak, want to thank you, all of the team at the TGA that have worked extraordinary hours to tick every box, to assess everything, to make sure that safety, safety, safety is the number one priority. They and our medical professionals and all of the companies involved uh, have worked literally around the clock for a long, long period. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Prime Minister and Minister, for uh, uh, supporting the uh, work and the announcement. So, this is the second vaccine that uh, we have approved for COVID-19. We're also the second, uh, only the second regulator in the world after the European Medicines Agency with whom we work very closely. We have a preferential long-standing collaborative relationship and it's been strengthened under COVID times. But we're the second major regulator to have actually done a, a full conditional approval of, uh, of a vaccine. There's a number of other countries, such as the UK, you're familiar with, uh, Brazil and so forth, who have uh, authorised this vaccine in emergency authorisation. And as the Minister said, just overnight, the World Health Organisation confirmed its support for an emergency use listing for this vaccine. They also confirmed a couple of things that I want to tackle head on, because I know that they've been the subject of some discussion both in the medical uh, fraternity and in the media. The first relates to uh, age, and uh, our approval for this vaccine uh, does not have an upper age limit. While the data for this vaccine in older groups is limited, and that goes back to the original design of the trials where AstraZeneca uh, targeted their initial trials towards healthcare workers who obviously are generally of working age and usually under 65, and only included uh, older people later on. But our analysis of the data uh, gives us no reason to suspect that uh, the, the vaccine would not be fully efficacious in, in older groups. Secondly, the experience in the UK in the rollout, and we've got to remember that uh, they have been vaccinating with the AstraZeneca vaccine now for uh, more than a month. And uh, their experience is also uh, of uh, very good results obtained with both, both of the major vaccines uh, in older groups. And of course, their rollout has been targeted not only towards frontline health workers, but also towards those in what the British call care homes. So uh, there's real world evidence of the vaccine going well in older groups. And also there's evidence uh, from uh, blood tests looking at the response of the immune system to these vaccines. Uh, which, which again shows a strong immune response in, in people over 60, people over 65 and so forth. Yes, more data on a lot of things will emerge as months and weeks and years go by, including uh, the duration, how long these vaccines actually provide protection for. But we, on the balance of the evidence, we have no reason and we felt there was no reason to limit its use to particular age groups. The second thing I want to tackle head on is efficacy, because a lot has been said about this vaccine. And as the Minister said, uh, a recent uh, study uh, just published a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Lancet, one of the world's top uh, medical journals, uh, showed from a more detailed analysis of trials, because as time goes on, you have more people who uh, may or may not get COVID from these trials, more people whose data can be assessed for safety and performance of these vaccines. 
and it showed 100% efficacy against severe disease, illness and death. More importantly, it showed uh, that uh, when there was a 12-week interval between doses, and this is what ATAGI, the advisory group, has recommended, that uh, there's 82% at least protection from those groups. And uh, what's important with that 12-week interval is it seems that if you leave it more and more weeks, that you do get uh, greater, greater protection. And frankly, there's not a difference when you go into the rural world between whether something's 82% or 90%. So I would emphasise that a lot of this discussion of, of, of numbers is, is not particularly relevant. What's important is to get vaccines into people's arms. And the AstraZeneca gives us a vaccine that can be used not only in major facilities, but also in primary care through GPs and potentially through, through pharmacy practices. Uh, and, and having a vaccine that's accessible in a country as wide and brown as ours is, is absolutely important. All this information has now been published. And if you do go to the TGA website, as well as the main health department website, you'll see that information. Finally, I'd just mention a little bit about pregnancy and vaccines, because uh, as a group of international regulators, this is something that is obviously keeping a lot of us uh, thinking. Now, like many, many clinical trials, uh, vaccines are not tested in pregnant individuals, whether it's a new medicine or a new vaccine. Generally, if you're known to be pregnant, uh, you, you can't volunteer for a clinical trial. It's just a safety measure, a precautionary measure. However, there were a number of people who didn't know that they were pregnant or became pregnant during those trials, and there haven't been reports of adverse outcomes. The other thing that regulators worldwide are doing is recognising that, especially in countries like the UK, especially in the US and in Europe, some of those hospitals cannot afford to take their pregnant nurses and doctors off the front line when they're in a crisis situation with a sheer number of cases. And so, Many of those people have exercised personal choice by being vaccinated, and they're being closely followed in a register. Now, obviously, those babies have yet to be born and so forth, but again, there's no evidence of, of anything untoward, such as miscarriage or illness during pregnancy. But as the weeks and months go on, we'll also know a lot more about pregnancy with these vaccines. The aim, of course, is as time goes on, we'll know more about the vaccines in all the groups in the community, including children. And uh, I'd also just like to close by saying that each of the major vaccine companies has now commenced studies either in adolescents or in some cases in children as young as six. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Professor Skewitt, and thank you again to you and everyone at the TGA for the, the extraordinary job they've done for their country um, over these many, many months. Um, seek your cooperation as usual because we have Professor Skewitt with us. Why don't we focus on the vaccine and the announcement first? I'm sure there are other issues you'd like to raise and we can address those then. So on the vaccine, David. Uh, and possibly Professor Skerritt could answer this one too, but he mentioned that uh, there was a stronger efficacy with a 12-week delay between the first and second jabs. I thought we were heading towards a rollout that was a three-week gap. Is that changing? What's going to be the approach on the gap? So yeah. the, the three-week gap relates to the Pfizer vaccine. Yeah. Uh, the recommendation on the gap for the AstraZeneca vaccine is 12 weeks, and that will obviously add complication to the logistics. And this is something that the rollout team, part of our same Department of Health, uh, that we've been meeting just today. Uh, Brendan Murphy and I and the others met to discuss that today. Now, what we said at TGA is you could give the second AstraZeneca jab anywhere between four and 12 weeks, because let's say, sadly, if you had to start cancer chemotherapy in a few weeks' time, you might want to bring that jab forward. So it's, it's efficacious as soon as four weeks after the AstraZeneca, but uh, the recommendation routinely is to leave it 12 weeks. Come back across this way. The TGA information on the jab says uh, it should be a case-by-case -case basis for older people. You've just said that there's no upper age limit. Can you explain what that means and should older people get the AstraZeneca vaccine? So we recommend that uh, older people should get the AstraZeneca vaccine. The wording case-by-case -case, I guess relates to a discussion of, uh, of uh, really it comes down to what old means. Uh, I'm 61. When I was 40 I thought 60 was old. Now I've decided 61 is very young. Uh, and so old is always in your mind. Uh, to, to, be, to be fair, uh, to, to be fair, what... Uh, 
I'm going to get into trouble now. Uh, d d to be fair, uh, we, we were aware, and there were reports globally, of deaths in Norwegian aged care facilities. Now, it turned out that, st sadly, hundreds of people in, in any state or territory die per month in aged care facilities of what we used to call old age. And so the issue about old people for any medicine or any vaccine or indeed any surgical procedure is look at what doctors call futility. If someone only has a few weeks to, uh, to live, you don't give them a hip replacement and you may not give them a vaccine or a medicine. So that's where we're hinting at. But uh, the vaccine is recommended uh, for use in all ages. Given the 12 week gap here, does that mean that to reach your goal of having everyone vaccinated by October, you would expect every Australian to have had at least their first jab by the end of July? And if I may, Professor Skerritt, how does that gap interact with people getting the flu vaccine? Do they have to wait till they've had both doses or could they get it in the middle? Well, I'll let Professor Skerritt deal with the second question and then Greg can do the other. I'll, I'll talk with respect to the flu vaccine. Again, this is an issue which uh, has occupied the minds of regulators worldwide. Because we're wanting to identify whether there are particular adverse events related to the, the COVID vaccines or the flu vaccines for that matter, if you give both of them together, you don't know which one may have caused the problem. Not that we're seeing significant problems. There's well-known issues such as headache, temperature, sore arm and so forth, but nothing that seems to be really very serious. And so for, at the moment, it's recommended that you have your shots 14 days or so apart. So if, for example, you're in a you know, uh, one, phase 1A group, if you're, say, a, a frontline quarantine worker or whatever, and you have your shot in the next couple of weeks, we'd recommend them to wait a couple of weeks till they have their, their flu shot. But they don't have to wait till the end of 12 weeks or the end of both shots to have their flu shot. Uh, just in terms of the, uh, the timing, uh, what it means is that uh, more Australians will have more vaccines earlier. Uh, that's a, uh, a happy byproduct of the decision. Uh, it also means that uh, we are absolutely on track. So every Australian uh, who seeks to have the vaccine will be in a position to have had uh, at least the first dose. We'll look at what it means with regards to the second dose. Uh, but frankly, it's very, very good news. It means higher efficacy. It means more Australians earlier. And it means a, a, a position where every Australian who seeks to have it will undoubtedly have had their first dose. We'll look. We'll now remodel what it means in terms of the tail, but uh, I would say it doesn't mean we're on track. It means we're ahead of schedule for where we intended to be. Okay, one here and then we'll come over. Can only side. deal with 12 weeks. Sorry, just on the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine for over 65s, is this, are you breaking away from precedent in terms of the lack of data? Um, would this have been approved if we weren't in a pandemic? No, we, we're not really breaking away from precedent. I, it's perhaps not well known, but uh, many vaccines are actually approved on what are known as immunological correlates. In other words, analyses of blood samples. So let's use the seasonal flu vaccine. As many of you will know, every year, because the flu vaccine mutates or drifts, so the flu virus mutates or drifts so much, uh, we need to bring in a new flu vaccine. Sometimes it's got four components. Sometimes one changes. In a bad year, two or three, or f we've never had all four change, thank God, but t t two or three can change. So it changes every year. Now, we simply, can't, don't have the time to wait till a flu season happens to see people get the flu and whether a vaccine works. And so we use a lot of tests with blood and cell samples. And so it's quite well established in vaccines to look at that evidence from blood and cell samples. And it showed quite a strong immune response in the over 65s. And so it's very similar to what we've been doing with other viruses, such as the flu virus, for a long time. Okay. If we had either one or both of these vaccines last month or the month before, like we have seen in other nations, Melbourne would still be in lockdown, other state capitals would have gone into lockdown. And with that in mind, was it worth it to go through the, the slower approval pro process uh, rather than going through the emergency approval process? I appreciate the question. Firstly, there has been no slow approval process. This has been I think the most efficient and, uh, and timely process that the TGA I think has ever undertaken for any vaccine. Um, and they've done it in a way which has cut no corners, ensured every inquiry that they would have undertaken in relation to a vaccine uh, would have been undertaken. And that was the safest way uh, to conduct that process and to arrive where we're at today. So the option of doing something different 
was not present without putting at risk the safety of the, uh, of the process. That is sacrosanct, I think, to the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, and let's not forget that the significant success that Australia had over the course of last year in comparison to other countries created the space. Australians created the space for Professor Skerritt to be able to do the best job that they are capable of doing. And I've got to tell you, um, Australia's TGA's best is the best in the world. And so that enabled them to do that. So that was the right decision. That was the right decision to do that. And that's why we proceeded on that basis. Yeah, Phil. I've just got on an IR. Could I ask you about IR then? Uh, unless there's va vaccine questions, because I'm going to excuse yeah. Professor Skerritt. Professor, yeah. um, we, we obviously uh, dealing with something new in terms of a, a multi-dose vial. What, uh, what wastage are you build, building into um, to supply? Because obviously we're oversupplied by, by raw number. And are there any circumstances in which you can envisage a particular person getting both vaccines? So, uh, you, as you've, you've mentioned, the government has procured more, many more vaccines than the whole population of Australia requires. And it may well be that we're in a position to share them with our Pacific neighbours in the coming months, uh, if you know, once we get to a situation of vaccine rollout in full swing. In terms of wastage, this is something that the uh, group working on the rollout is very focused on. And, and I won't uh, steal their thunder by going into detailed strategies, but they have detailed strategies to make sure that there's going to be enough people present and available, for example, to use up the entire Pfizer uh, vial. One of the advantages of the AstraZeneca vial, and that's why I said earlier, it's important to remember that uh, approval of the AstraZeneca va vaccine will really help with people getting vaccinated because this is a vial that can go, if you use half an AstraZeneca vial in a GP's practice, it can go back in the fridge overnight and then it can be used again the next day. You don't have to throw it out. So there's a lot of advantages to this product, including less wastage. And I'll say the double, are there any circumstances in which someone can get oh, uh, Well. We're encouraging people, and this is a consistent message globally, we're encouraging people with your two shots to have two of the same thing. We don't have a crystal ball, and what we don't know is, especially with the emergence of variants, or maybe these vaccines provide two years protection but not life, whether in 2022, 2023, people will have to have a booster. Uh, no one knows that. Again, it's something that uh, we're looking at fairly closely. The immune response seems to be pretty durable, but. There's only one way that we'll know next year whether people have to have a booster, and that is wait until next year. It may then be that uh, a different vaccine is ideal to use as a booster. There actually are some trials starting in the UK and one or two other countries where they're deliberately using two different vaccines to see how well that combination works. People who have already had coronavirus, will they be receiving either of these vaccines? And Prime Minister, today Victoria has announced it's going to be um, building its own quarantine facility, which could spell the end of hotel quarantine. Given that we've just approved two vaccines and we're starting the rollout, is something like that necessary? And will you be providing any federal assistance? Well, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do the sh first one short. Uh, again, the, the advice, there's no advice saying don't have it. And of course, in Australia, we're fortunate that the numbers are fairly small. But a number of other countries are vaccinating people who have had coronavirus. There's no adverse event. In fact, what they're, they're suggesting is that some people may only get off with one shot because, in a way, what the, the vaccination does is give a further boost to the natural immunity you may have had from catching the disease. But uh, time will tell with Australians. That's one area that our hospitals and doctors will carefully monitor. They'll take particular interest in people who have had coronavirus and then they give a vaccination to. Prime Thank Minister. you, Professor Skerritt. Look, I've got the other issue, of course, we'll work with the Victorian Government, the New South Wales Government, the Queensland Government on all these issues, as we always have. I mean, we've provided significant support to all the states, particularly through the Australian Defence Force, and when it comes to supporting those quarantine arrangements. In New South Wales, they've operated hotel quarantine at, at triple the capacity of when, when Victoria was actually um, open. And uh, they've been able to do that quite successfully through hotel quarantine. I note also that the New Zealand Government, um, which doesn't operate as a federation, um, have also consistently used hotel quarantine as the most effective way to enable people to come back and, and for those facilities uh, to also provide an appropriate quarantine period. But we'll continue to work with states on these issues as they wish to pursue them, also seeking to get as many Australians home. should stress international travellers are not allowed to come to Australia. Australians 
residents and citizens are allowed to return home, and that's what we're seeking to do. In many of these cases, uh, we, we look at these as supplementary capacity to hotel quarantine. It is true, um, even though uh, on an international scale, the number of incidents in the Victorian situation are few. They've, of course, had a, a pretty significant impact, particularly last year. Uh, but it is also true that in seven other states and territories, they've had, uh, they've had great success in managing that inflow and also preventing both breaches. But where breaches occur, uh, their systems have been very strong, whether that's in Queensland or Western Australia or, of course, New South Wales or, or other places. But we'll, we'll work with them, as, as we always have, and I know the Victorian Government has always appreciated that support. Yeah. Prime Minister, Greg? are you saying they should not be used to replace hotel quarantine but complement it? And, and, work with the and, Victorian Government. That's all and, I said, Greg. Are, are, you con are you concerned that Victoria, through this announcement today and through the language of Dan Andrews over the past week, that he is shifting away from the hotel, a preference for hotel quarantine? Well, that's just not clear yet, based on the information that's in front of us. But, you know, the objective the task doesn't change. Um, our focus as a government is, of course, on delivering uh, the $6.5 billion vaccine program. And that's where the Commonwealth has been putting in our effort around these issues. And we've worked with the states on, on the many other issues. So 2021 um, can uh, prove to be a, a, a far more open year than 2020 was. Prime Minister, you said this morning that I'm not happy about uh, this being brought to my attention about the Brittany Higgins like issues, um, which I'm happy to do, um, but I, I don't think we need to detain Professor Skerritt for that. But Chris, did you have one more for yeah, Professor Skerritt? Travel as you roll out this vaccine and people are vaccinated, are you going to change your disposition towards Australians travelling overseas and returning who have been vaccinated? Not clear yet, and we have to wait on the evidence for that and, uh, and the success of the vaccine and what that means in terms of transmissibility and other issues. That obviously we don't rule that out. Uh, but those decisions will be guided by the medical advice when they're, when they're ultimately taken. But I look forward to that day. So we're going to move away from those issues. Professor Skerritt, thank you to you, you and all your team. You're doing a great job. Thank you very much. You said I'm not happy about the fact that this, uh, the Brittany Higgins matter was not brought to my attention. And I can assure you people know that. Amongst those people, I assume, is Defence Minister Linda Reynolds. Is are people from your office also? Have they also been spoken to you with disquiet uh, people, about this? People know. People know, and they should know. And uh, and these are issues that I, I would hope would come to my attention. And and that is one of the many things that uh, that uh, I've asked the Deputy Secretary of the PM and C to look at as as we as we work through the issues that have to be worked through. And and. Uh, and we, we want to make sure uh, that the, those systems are up to the standard that I would expect. Heads roll, heads roll over this I've answered minister. the question, Andrew. Well, thanks. Andrew's question, though, Prime Minister, uh, Brittany Higgins says there were three very senior people in your office who knew about this alleged rape within days of it occurring, and you found out almost two years later. These are people you talk to on a daily basis. What, why did they not tell you? Were they protecting you? What was the reason for you not being informed? Well, in terms of three people, well, I should stress that the um, chief of staff of uh, the minister's office at the time uh, was not in the prime minister's office. They came and worked in the prime minister's office at a later time. So they were not there working directly to, to, to me or um, to Dr Kunkel in, in my office. Um, well, there is, um, I, I should stress that in relation to my principal private secretary, uh, there is nothing that has been put in front of me, nothing, including phone records or anything else, that suggests that uh, that, that indeed was the case. There so there was a, an issue of a security breach which was dealt with at the time, and uh, the alleged perpetrator was sacked, removed, um, quite swiftly um, over the security breach. In terms of the allegation of a sexual assault, that was not in front, I'm advised, of my office at that time. And so that, that matter came, came later and was being dealt with within the minister's office and uh, at, on, on an anonymous basis, ultimately. And so that matter was not at that point brought to our attention because the matter then didn't proceed to a police investigation. And that's why today um, I've expressed my concern about how these matters didn't progress to a police investigation, because that is always, that would always be my wish. That that should that be what the, um, the Brittany wanted. You didn't get to express that wish. They didn't tell you. Were they protecting? Well, I know that uh, Minister Reynolds expressed that wish directly, and that 
it was her wish that this matter be taken forward for investigation, but, but ultimately, ultimately, um, that was a, a choice made at the time. Why didn't the minister tell you, Prime Minister? Well, I understand Minister, minister Reynolds will, make, will, will say something further about this, but I understand there was a judgment made about the balance of protecting Brittany's privacy at the time. And a judgment was made on that basis. Now, that judgment can certainly uh, be, uh, uh, be commentated upon. It can certainly be judged. Uh, but that was my understanding of uh, what occurred at that time. I want to stress again that this awful incident, this terrible incident, um, those who were around Brittany at the time were endeavouring to support and to help her. Now, as I said this morning, over the passage of time, clearly, that was not effective. And, and I accept that. I accept that absolutely. Yes. Do you not believe, Brittany, that she was contacted by a senior person in your office to be checked in on in the, in the wake of well, similar really reporting? Go on. But if, if, why, why would someone from your office check in with her following the reporting on Four Corners around that issue well, if it wasn't because they were aware of it being beyond a security well, the, issue? The point I'm making to you is, is that is not the, the recollection or the records of, of my staff on that matter. It's mm. just not. So I can't really speak more to it than that. I, I understand that over time, particularly in situations like this, that information can become confused over the time about who makes contact and things like that. I, I accept that. So I make no judgments about that. In fact, one of the things that have concerned me most about this issue is that clearly the trauma that built up over a period of time well after the incident itself as well. And I think that's one of the key things I want to hear from the Deputy Secretary about how we can ensure that support is immediate, effective and ongoing, because on those three tests, particularly the latter one, clearly that support wasn't a, provided in a way that supported Brittany. As I said, that's something I would expect for my daughter, and I should have no lesser expectations for Brittany. And that's why I've taken the actions that I have today. Was she mistaken in her recount? Was she mistaken in her well, recount that she's made? I can't you, comment sort of on it because I wasn't a party right to either of the conversations. If something like this was to happen again, how quickly would you expect to be told if one of your ministers was aware, and who would you expect to be told by? Oh, well, there are two points there. Uh, the first one is, and this is what I've referred to the Deputy Secretary, and I flag this, that in cases like this there is an argument for a mandatory uh, advice to the relevant department, which in this case would be the Department of Finance. But I just add a note of caution on this, that I would not want to have anything done in this process that in any way might create a, a triggered action that might lead to someone like Brittany in this circumstance not wanting to proceed. So I want to be very confident that any of these things that we might do around this event would in no way impede the agency of the victim in these cases in, and, and someone like Brittany in these cases. So I'm not going to rush to um, or any knee-jerk reaction here. There is best practice in a, in a lot of other jurisdictions, in a lot of other workplaces, and I would like them to look at that and carefully advise us about what the automatic responses should be. Now, it is also possible that in circumstances like this that the, uh, uh, an, a, a terrible incident like this can be advised to me, both by the minister and, and through my office, um, in an anonymous way. And I think it is very important to protect the privacy of individuals in these situations, and it is my absolute understanding that that was the intent of Minister Reynolds. Yeah, on the exact time your office knew about this alleged rape, what is your advice on that? You've obviously been speaking to people in your office about it. Well, my understanding is that that precise matter was within the last couple of weeks. Can I turn my out in the last hour? Um, Minister Board has announced you've dumped that provision pertaining to the better off overall mm. test in order to secure the rest of the bill. Labor is unmoved by the saying, if you get re-elected, you're going to try and bring it back anyway. Can I get your response to that? Well, the reason that we've decided not to proceed with that element of the package is because we've been engaged in good faith discussions um, with parties in the Senate. And uh, that those good faith discussions um, have arrived at the point where if we want to go further, then it's important that that provision um, no longer be pursued. 
So we think in good faith that that is a good way. Now that shouldn't come as a surprise. We were very clear that in trying to get things through the parliament, we'd, we'd work with good faith partners. Now the Labor Party hasn't sought to engage with us at all. We got more engagement out of the union movement than we got out of the Labor Party. And so the question now is given that seemed to be the, the issue they had, well, why are they now going to vote against a bill that actually ensures people get paid and that there's a pathway from casuals to permanent? I mean, is Labor going to drop the politics now and get on with it so we can get people back into jobs? Or are they going to cling on to this um, as a way of continuing to engage in a political debate here in Canberra? It's, it, it's really a matter for them. But <laughs> now, Once we go through this package, then that's the package that we'll put and that's the package that we will legislate. I've always been very clear that we're, we're seeking to get things done here. Where things can't get done and the parliament doesn't support things, then, then why would we put um, people through that process? Prime Minister, what review you've announced this morning, mm. the one by the Deputy Secretary and the one being mm. from Celia Hammond, yep. what's your time frame for those reviews and will you commit to making the findings of them public? Well, what I'll, I'm going to wait for further advice uh, from both Celia and Stephanie about both of those issues on the timing. I mean, this is new. I want them to consider what they need to do, how long it would take for them to do that job thoroughly. And so I'll wait further advice on both of those questions to come from both of them as we work through the process of, of having this set up and established. Today in the party room, um, I had a fair bit to say about this issue with my colleagues and the responsibility on all of us. But as I said uh, at my earlier press conference today, um, it's just not on the government members of parliament to ensure that it's the right environment here in this place. It's incumbent on all members of parliament in this place. They're all employers and, uh, and frankly, everybody who holds a position of authority in this building, um, whether they're running a news agency, they're running the prime minister's office or they're running an MP's office, we all who work in this building have an obligation to try and make it as safe as possible for everyone who works here. Ask Mr Hunt on vaccine. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to call it then after that one because yeah, uh, question I think, time. Um, Jacinda Ardern is not, not very happy with you and, and your government uh, for the stripping of uh, citizenship of someone who went overseas, uh, potentially to be recruited by ISIS. Can you give us the background to that and what assurances are you going to give Jacinda Ardern that what Australia did uh, is in uh, New Zealand's interests as well as its own? Well, my job is Australia's interests. That's my job, and it's, it's, it's my job as, a, as, a, as the Australian Prime Minister to put Australia's national security interests first. So I think all Australians would agree with that. Now, the legislation that was passed through our parliament automatically cancels the citizenship of a dual citizen where they've been engaged in terrorist activities of this nature. Uh, and that happens automatically. And that has been a known part of Australia's law for some time. Now, I understand that the New Zealand government has, has uh, some issues with that, um, and I understand that, and the Prime Minister and I um, are scheduled to, to speak later today. We speak quite frequently. This is an issue we've discussed before. So I'll leave how we practically deal with those issues um, to our discussion later today, and, and I'm sure the many others that we'll have. There is still a lot more unknown about this case and, and where it sits and, and where it may go to next. And so I think that will also be a subject of our discussions. But Australia's interest here is that we do not want to see terrorists who fought with terrorism organisations enjoying privileges of citizenship, which I think they forfeit, the second they gauge as an enemy of our country. And I think Australians would agree with that. Thanks all very much. Come.